If you're having three to four drinks per week, you could be unknowingly going towards alcoholism and putting your brain at risk. Let's join Dr. Huberman, a brilliant neuroscientist, on a journey to reveal the truth about alcohol and its impact on your memory, mood, and thinking. After hearing his advice, you'll learn to tame your drinking habits, shield your brain's health, and restore mental clarity. Let's jump in. So to make very clear, drinking a lot, three or four drinks per night, every night of the week, is clearly bad for the brain. I'd love to be able to tell you otherwise, but that's just a fact. When you ingest alcohol, you are, yes, ingesting a poison, and that poison is converted into an even worse poison in your body. Today, we're discussing alcohol, one of the most commonly consumed substances on the planet Earth. We will talk about severe alcohol intake, binge drinking. We will also talk about hangover. Today's discussion is really geared toward giving you information. It is not about judging alcohol intake or lack of alcohol intake. I just want you to be able to make the most informed decision about alcohol possible. For many years, it's been known that high levels of alcohol consumption, so 12 to 24 drinks per week or more, is certainly causing neurodegeneration, in particular of the so-called neocortex, the outer layers of the brain that house associated of memories, that house our ability to think and plan, that house our ability to regulate our more primitive drives according to context, etc. A recent study, however, finally addressed the question of whether or not low to moderate amounts of alcohol consumption can cause brain degeneration. The title of the study is Associations Between Alcohol Consumption and Gray and White Matter Volumes in the UK Biobank, the United Kingdom Biobank. What this study did is it looked at the brains, both the gray matter and the white matter, of more than 30,000, indeed more than 35,000, generally healthy middle-aged and older adults in the United Kingdom who were drinking various amounts of alcohol. What they found was that even for people that were drinking low to moderate amounts of alcohol, so one or two drinks per day, there was evidence of thinning of the neocortex, so loss of neurons in the neocortex and other brain regions. And I don't say this in order to cause alarm. I tell you this because they are important data because they reveal and indeed answer the question that has been burning for so long as to whether or not chronic alcohol intake can disrupt the brain, even if the chronic intake is very low. I think many people out there are drinking somewhere between one and two drinks per night or day of the week on average. So that would be seven to 14 drinks per week. So this is an important study because it says that if you're consuming even just seven glasses of wine across the week, it's likely that there is going to be some degeneration of your brain in response to that alcohol intake. When you drink alcohol, it can pass into all the cells and tissues of your body. It has no trouble just passing right into those cells. So unlike a lot of substances and drugs that actually attach to the surface of cells, to receptors as they're called, little parking spots, and then trigger a bunch of downstream like domino cascades of effects, alcohol actually has its own direct effects on cells because it can really just pass into those cells. The fact that it can pass into so many organs and cells so easily is really what explains explains its damaging effects. There are three main types of alcohol. There's isopropyl, methyl, and ethyl alcohol. And only the last one, ethyl alcohol or ethanol, is fit for human consumption. However, it is still toxic, okay? It produces substantial stress and damage to cells. Ethanol produces substantial damage to cells. And it does that because when you ingest ethanol, it has to be converted into something else because it is toxic to the body. And there's a molecule inside of all of us called NAD. So when you ingest ethanol, NAD and related biochemical pathways are involved in converting that ethanol into something called acetylaldehyde. It's broken down into acetylaldehyde. And if you thought ethanol was bad, acetylaldehyde is particularly bad. Acetylaldehyde is poison it will kill cells. It damages and kills cells and it is indiscriminate as to which cells it damages and kills. Now, that's a problem, obviously, and the body deals with that problem by using another component of the NAD biochemical pathway to convert acetylaldehyde into something called acetate. Acetate is actually something that your body can use as fuel. And that process of going from ethanol to acetylaldehyde to acetate does involve the production of a toxic molecule. If your body can't do this conversion of ethanol to acetylaldehyde to acetate fast enough, well, acetylaldehyde will build up in your body and cause more damage. And the place where it does that is within the liver. And cells within the liver are very good at this conversion process, but they are cells and they are exposed to the acetylaldehyde in the conversion process. And so cells within the liver really take a beating in the 
alcohol metabolism events. So the key thing to understand here is that when you ingest alcohol, you are, yes, ingesting a poison and that poison is converted into an even worse poison in your body. Now, the important thing to understand is that it is the poison, the acetaldehyde itself, that leads to the effect of being inebriated or drunk. I think most people don't realize that, that being drunk is actually a poison-induced disruption in the way that your neural circuits work. People that are regular drinkers or that have a genetic predisposition to alcoholism, when they drink, they tend to feel very energized and very good for longer periods of time. Those people typically experience an increase in alertness and mood when they drink, whereas occasional drinkers will have a briefer, meaning less long-lasting period of feeling good when they drink, and then more quickly transition into a state in which they're tired or they start losing motor skills, they start slurring their speech. When people ingest this poison, because indeed it is poison, the range of effects is very different and you can reliably predict who are the people with a predisposition to alcoholism and who are the people who are more regular drinkers by the contour, the timing of the different effect. People who tend to feel more alert and excited every time they drink, they tend to get a real lift, they become kind of the life of the party and that lasts a long while. Those people are the ones that really have to be careful about predisposition for alcoholism. For the person that drinks, say, every Thursday night, every Friday night or goes out only on Saturdays, but every Saturday. There's evidence that there are changes in the neural circuits of the brain that control habitual behavior and impulsive behavior, and they are modified and strengthened in ways that make those people more habitual and more impulsive outside the times in which they are drinking. And when they drink, impulsive and habitual behavior tends to increase even further. And we all know the effects of being drunk can be bad, right, can be, bad in terms of judgment, motor coordination, certainly driving drunk is a terrible thing, get you or other people killed and so on. But rarely do we hear about the changes in neural circuits from just one or two nights of regular drinking. That person is going to experience a decrease in this top-down inhibition, so an increase in impulsivity and habitual behavior because the break on those behaviors has been removed while they're drinking, but also changes in the very neural circuits that allow habitual and impulsive behavior to occur more readily even when they're not drinking. If you eat something prior to drinking alcohol or while ingesting alcohol, it will slow the absorption of alcohol into the bloodstream. In other words, you won't feel as drunk as fast. If you are already inebriated or you've had a glass of wine or, or a beer and you eat something, chances are that alcohol has already made it into your bloodstream because it moves into the bloodstream so quickly. Again, it's fat soluble and water soluble. So within minutes, if you have an empty stomach within five to 10 minutes, that alcohol is gonna be within your bloodstream and distributed through your body, maybe even faster, depending on the type of alcohol and your metabolism. But if you're already drunk and you eat something, it's not going to sober you up more quickly, but it certainly will blunt the effects of any additional alcohol that you might consume. And if you're somebody who is concerned about getting too drunk too quick, even from a small amount of alcohol, having some food in your gut can certainly be beneficial. Most people, as they drink more and more, will now start to feel more and more suppressed. The forebrain is now shutting down quite a lot. A lot of the motor cortical areas that control coordinated movement and deliberate movement start to shut down. So people start to slur their speech. People start to shuffle their feet. People forget their posture. People start to lean on things. People start passing out on couches. There's a great depression not depression of the psychiatric depression sort, but a depression of alertness and arousal and eventually people will pass out. Now, I said most people because there's a subset of people that have gene variants or who are chronic drinkers or who are chronic drinkers and have gene variants that as they ingest the third and fourth and fifth drink, what happens? They become more alert. They start talking more, they feel great. They have all sorts of ideas about the fun they could have that night. And they're the ones that if you've ever fallen asleep at a party for whatever reason, or you're getting tired and you're yawning, you're looking around the room and like these people are still drinking and partying and they're having what seems to be this amazing time. Often, not always, those are the future alcoholics in the room. The liver is also communicating with the brain through chemical signaling and neural signaling. So we have the gut liver brain axis. And what you find is that people who ingest alcohol at any amount are are inducing a disruption in the so-called gut microbiome, the trillions of little microbacteria that take resident in your gut and that live inside you all the time and that help support your immune system and that literally signal by way of electrical signals and chemical signals to your brain to increase the release of things like serotonin and dopamine and regulate your mood generally in positive ways. Well, alcohol really disrupts those bacteria. 
And this should come as no surprise. It's well known if you want to you know, sterilize something, you want to kill the bacteria, you pour alcohol on it. Alcohol kills bacteria and it is indiscriminate with respect to which bacteria it kills. So when we ingest alcohol and it goes into our gut, it kills a lot of the healthy gut microbiota. For some people, it might even just be helpful to realize that as you try and wean yourself off alcohol or maybe even go cold turkey, that increased anxiety and feelings of stress should be expected. Some increase in stress should be expected and it should be expected because of that increase in cortisol that occurs with even low level consumption yet chronic alcohol consumption. Hangover is a constellation of effects ranging from headache to nausea to what's sometimes called anxiety which is anxiety that follows a day of drinking. The other aspects of hangover, such as the stomach ache or headache or feelings of malaise or fogginess, those could be related to a number of different things and probably are related to a number of different things. First of all, the sleep that one gets after even just one, yes, even just one glass of wine or a beer is not the same sleep that you get when you don't have alcohol circulating in your system. And not trying to be a downer here, certainly is supported by lots and lots of quality peer-reviewed studies in animals and in humans that when alcohol is present in the brain and bloodstream, that the architecture of sleep is disrupted. Slow wave sleep, deep sleep, and rapid eye movement sleep, all of which are essential for getting a restorative night's sleep are all disrupted. So for those of you that are drinking a glass or two of wine or having a hard liquor drink or a beer in order to fall asleep, the sleep you're getting is simply not high quality sleep or certainly not as high quality as the sleep you'd be getting if you did not have alcohol in your system. In terms of hangover and headache, we know that that's caused by vasoconstriction, the constriction of blood vessels that tends to occur as a rebound after a night of drinking. Alcohol can act as a vasodilator. It can dilate the blood vessels. It allows for more movement of blood and other things through the bloodstream. And alcohol tends to induce some vasodilation, at least in some of the capillary beds. And then when the alcohol wears off, there's vasoconstriction and people get brutal headaches. There's a lot of kind of lore, um, old school lore about how to relieve a hangover. There's the lore that one one should simply ingest more alcohol. What terrible advice that is. That's just going to delay an even worse hangover. Now, one thing that you'll also hear out there is that deliberate cold exposure, for instance, taking a cold shower might relieve hangover. There is some evidence that increasing levels of epinephrine in the bloodstream can actually help with alcohol clearance. There's some evidence pointing to the fact that when levels of epinephrine, adrenaline, are raised in the brain and bloodstream, that some of the components of alcohol metabolism can be accelerated and some of the inebriating effects of alcohol can be reduced. Is the dehydration associated with alcohol. Alcohol is a diuretic, multiple reasons. It causes people to excrete not only water, but also sodium. Sodium is an electrolyte critical for the function of neurons. So making sure that you have enough sodium, potassium, and magnesium, so-called electrolytes, is going to be important for proper brain function, bodily organ function. Even for people that have just had one or two drinks the night before, it's likely that your electrolyte balance and your fluid balance is going to be disrupted. And that's because alcohol also disrupts the so-called vasopressin pathway. I would say better would be two glasses of water given the dehydrating effects of alcohol and even better would be water with electrolytes. That certainly would set you up for a better day the next day. There are some additional things that one can do for relieving hangover. And one of them is to be very thoughtful about what sorts of alcohol one consumes. So I find this interesting. There have actually been studies of which types of alcohol lead to the greatest hangovers. The consumption of beer provided it is not over consumption so this one or two beers is less likely to cause a hangover than say whiskey but a glass of whiskey for instance is more likely to cause hangover than gin and yet a glass of rum or red wine is more likely to cause a hangover than any of the other things i've mentioned so far at the top 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 of the list of drinks that induce hangover is brandy and one could then say well doesn't brandy have a lot of sugar maybe it's the sugar that's causing hangover turns out, however, that when one looks at drinks, alcoholic drinks and sugar content and hangover, at the very bottom of the list is, gosh, this makes me cringe just to think about, is ethanol diluted in orange juice. Ugh, I can't believe people actually drink this. Vodka was third on the list from the bottom of drinks that induce hangover. Again, this is within amounts that are comfortable for the person to drink, that they have enough experience with or that they have the body weight to tolerate without getting very, very drunk. So the point is that if it were sugar that's causing hangover, well then the ethanol dilute in orange juice would probably be at the top of the list in, to, in terms of inducing hangover, but it's not, it's at the bottom of the list. And brandy is at the top of the list. I know a number of people are going to ask, perhaps are screaming, is drinking good for me in any way? For instance, many people have probably heard that resveratrol is good for people and that red wine is enriched in resveratrol. I hate to break it to you, but the reality is that if indeed 
resveratrol is good for us. The amount of red wine that one would have to drink in order to get enough resveratrol in order for it to be health promoting is so outrageously high that it would surely induce other negative effects that would offset the positive effects of resveratrol. I also want to emphasize that there are things that people can do to at least partially offset some of the negative effects of alcohol as it relates to predisposition to the formation of certain kinds of tumors and cancers. I also want to be clear before I say it that doing the things I'm about to tell you is not a guarantee that you're not going to get cancer, nor is it a guarantee that alcohol is not going to lead to an increased predisposition for certain kinds of cancers. And the two things are consumption of folate and other B vitamins, especially B12. People who are pregnant should absolutely not consume alcohol. Fetal alcohol syndrome is well known and established. It's terrible. Fetuses experience diminished brain development that's often permanent, diminished limb development, diminished organ development in the periphery, meaning you know, the heart, the lungs, the liver, etc. Ingesting alcohol while pregnant is simply a bad idea. If you look online, you will sometimes be able to find, sadly, that some people believe that certain kinds of alcohol are not detrimental to fetuses. They'll say, well, champagne is safe for a pregnant mother to drink, but beer is not. That is absolutely categorically false. Alcohol is alcohol. There is no evidence whatsoever that consuming certain types of alcohol is safer for fetuses than others. Alcohol is a toxin, and the reason fetal alcohol syndrome exists is because the ability of that toxin to disrupt cellular processes. The point here is to illustrate where the problems lie with alcohol consumption, but also what I've tried to do is to point you to some resources that can help offset some of those negative effects. Will they offset all the effects? I can't say that for sure, but certainly taking measures to offset some of the negative effects of any alcohol consumption that you might be having or doing is going to be beneficial to you.